Thank you very much. My name is Anne LaFrance, and I am the uh, co-chair of the Data Privacy and Cybersecurity uh, group uh, that is a global group at our law firm called Squire Patton Boggs. So I do a lot of work in this area, uh, despite the American accent, primarily in uh, Europe and the Middle East, where there's quite a bit happening, and this keeps us very busy. Um, it's interesting to note how conferences, and I have been coming to these conferences for many more years than I like to think, but how these conferences over the years have come to be progressively, um, I don't, wouldn't say yet quite, dominated by the issues of privacy and cybersecurity. But if you look at the program, you'll see that it is, it is a, a dominant, fe it, I think it is a dominant feature now. Uh, and I think you know all of us as private citizens, private consumers, private people, human beings, worry about these issues, um, think about these issues, understand that there are trade-offs. Um, but many of us uh, are also in a professional capacity thinking about these issues, whether from an industry perspective, a government perspective um, in the sense of national security, a government perspective in the sense of consumer protection, um, another type of government perspective, which is marketing politically to consumers. Um, so there are many, many facets of this that you know we we could probably talk about for for a week uh, and and leave out the the telecoms issues even uh, or the media issues even even some of the sessions where you think well that's not really related to data protection if you think about the NBN discussion there is even a view that many governments are looking to a single uh, network uh, solution. Um, in order to facilitate surveillance, um, question don't know, but it but this this goes around in the circles that I that I live in, and uh, I'm sure you guys will have heard that as well. So even in something as structural and technical uh, as that, um, we, these issues circulate. Um, I think the role of the government as um, a, a protector of consumers, but also as a user of data, um, is is a schizophrenic one, um, and we have to deal with that, all of us, in our industry uh, lives and also in our personal lives. Um, the role of business uh, is also schizophrenic in some ways because most businesses realize that uh, as interesting <coughs> and important as getting access to personal data is for their businesses, um, that if it's not done properly, there will be a huge deficit of trust in whether it's the internet or the applications or whatever. So uh, the issue, I think, is one that, you know, is also m multi-dimensional for business as well, and we'll hear about that on the panel today. Um, is everybody hearing me? No? Sorry, even closer? I'll have to kiss it. Okay, <laughs> great. Who was here before? <laughs> um, I want my own private microphone. Um, and then finally, I think from a, a consumer perspective, um, you know, we heard, I think the first session, um, was it Australia who was talking about stupid consumers? I mean, what, what sh who is the average consumer? Who are we protecting? What, what are we protecting them from? And, uh, you know, who, who uh, what level of expertise should we expect them to understand, have? Are things changing over time? I mean, what I know how to do to protect myself on the internet is nothing like my nieces who are, you know, 15 and 17 know. Um, so these things evolve. They're also different across countries. Um, even in, the, in Europe, where I tend to focus, the difference between what is perceived as privacy or privacy in the UK is very different from what is considered to be of material concern in, in Germany, for example. So just to set the frame, I mean, there's so many issues that we could go into, and we've got a terrific panel giving pretty much every perspective, I would say, except the elephant who's not in the room, which is government qua surveiller, um, but uh, they probably would have to kill us if they were here and told us what they do. Um, so we'll just have to think about their role, uh, and perhaps we can discuss it uh, without them here. Um, we're, I'm going to give the, uh, the floor first to Cordell Green. Cordell, as many of you know, because he's a, a, a I think you've, you've been here as probably as many years as I have, Cordell. Um, Cordell is Executive Director of the Broadcasting Commission of um, Jamaica, 
and in that capacity, um, he has uh, assisted with the digital transition in Jamaica. Um, he's a lawyer and a broadcaster by background, um, and I think the focus that he'll bring to us is uh, one of connectivity, but also how data is being used in that sense um, as a, a sort of a currency. So, Cordell? Thank you. Thank you very much. Could we get the presentation up, please? Yes, so I want to talk about connectivity and monetization of personal information. I'd like to um, begin working. Can you advance the slide? Well, I'd like to begin with a comment by, uh, there we go, by Parag Khanna in a book he has recently published that connectivity, not geography, is our destiny. I think that simple statement takes us to the topic and helps us to begin to think about consumption patterns, attitudes, and priorities. And, you know, in the regulators' forum and the discussions we have been having at this conference, there's been a contention about how we organize distribution of content, and there are some of us, and I belong to that group, who are finding it increasingly difficult to use regulation to uphold models which are being successfully resisted by consumers and undermined by technology. There might even be a public interest argument that regulation should not be used in that way in the digital age, but I fear if we hold to geographic limitations or the models that hold to geographic limitations are going to be um, left uh, behind. And largely because the connectivity we're talking about now is about to change <coughs> rapidly by six exponential technologies. 3D printing, artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual reality, add, add augmented reality, drones, and the internet of things. And I am not of the view that this is going to happen sometime in the future. I think it's going to be quicker than we think. A few months ago, I was in California at the Singularity University Summit sitting with the very people who are driving these technologies. And they're not talking in terms of a decade. I think they want to roll out disruptive technologies much quicker than we believe. And British parliamentarians are onto this. Andrea just shared with me yesterday a BBC report that the British Parliament is already coming to terms with the fact that artificial intelligence is going to transform our societies and that government should begin to think about um, the implications. And I believe the same applies to um, regulators. All the devices we carry, those at home, those at the workplace, they are connecting and they're going to connect more and in a seemingly um, prescient way. Um, applications are already searching our communication history. We can use GPS to find locations. Um, Google Map can be used to then triangulate. And the devices we use are going to be taking decisions for us or aiding us to take um, uh, decisions. Here in Thailand, the Sinagara Hospital has realized a hundred percent uptime of their medical equipment. They have cut maintenance costs by 50 percent. They have cut down fault reporting time from two weeks to five minutes. All of this made possible by proactive 
machine-to-machine -machine alerts from medical equipment. And the question we have to ask ourselves is we all want these benefits at the enterprise level and the personal level, but at what price do we enjoy the benefits of connectivity? Our email, operating systems, online search engines, browsers, many apps are ostensibly free. And to keep it that way, internet giants and even dwarfs must know our friends, what we say to them, what they say to us, the sites we visit, what we do online, and more. I'm going to use Pokemon Go as an example, not because I want to pick on them, but because they are leading um, what I see coming in terms of augmented um, reality. The makers wanted full access to players' accounts, so the application could see and modify all the information in Google accounts. Now, Pokemon Go back down from that because we know there were some public protests, but I took a look at the privacy policy, and I'm not grasping what is the difference now than what people are complaining about. The application now wants the IP address, that one is obvious, what we browse, the time spent, the links clicked on, but most interestingly, other statistics. That captures, I believe, everything and anything. The policy also say, says, interestingly, and this is something I believe regulators are going to have to begin to think through, and policymakers, because consumers are also having a different perspective on this issue, that the personal information collected is a business asset. It's proprietary. And because it is proprietary, Pokemon Go says we can disclose any information to government or law enforcement officials, but they go on to say our private parties in our sole discretion. And even if the account is terminated or deactivated, the information can be retained for a commercially reasonable time period. Now, I doubt that apart from industrial lawyers and regulators and civil society activists, I doubt there are even a million persons in the world who have read um, the, the, uh, this uh, uh, provision. Now, what is most interesting about all of this is that as we're seeing increased intrusion comes along a counter-intuitive response from the public. There are signs that the public is changing its attitude towards the protection of personal information. Intel this year released a study, a worldwide study, in which the majority of respondents indicated a willingness to share their personal data in exchange for money. So it seems everyone is waking up to the reality that personal data is the oil of the 21st century. But there is also a wide gap in how the valuation of that oil is being looked at. So I looked at Google's advertising revenues per user, which was $45 in 2014. Facebook's advertising revenue per user was $9.45 in 2014. It has since risen to $12 in 2015. But in 2010, Koreans were asked to value their personal information. And they put it at between $500 to $1,500. So there's great information asymmetry um, somewhere. The bigger point, though, I want to make 
is that as consumers take an interest in the commodification of personal information, what is becoming clear is that the risks, the risks are not sufficiently being discussed or people don't seem to be aware of the risks. Uh, Profile-based advertising, profile-based business decisions, price discrimination, reputational harm, temporal determinacy, stories that stay around forever and we can't distinguish between what is dated and what is current. This is the context in which regulators have to be um, looking at the age in which we are operating. The dilemma is the combination of exponential technologies, low digital literacy, and commodification of personal information. And this raises the question then whether the existing legal um, framework deals with the situation um, adequately or sufficiently. The EU's general data regulation, which becomes effective in 2018, provides interesting provisions. I believe it is a worthwhile attempt to begin to deal with these questions. I am not sanguine about how this will work, but we will see in 2015. 2018. But I think what is clear is that there is a transatlantic divide and views are not settled. So there's an interesting case, Storm and Pay Time, that is currently making its way through the U.S. judicial system. It is now before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. And at first instance, the judge in that case decided that there is no cause of action if privacy is violated through hacking, unless it can be proved that the information was misused. The same judge acknowledged that there are only two types of companies left in the United States. Those that have been hacked and those that don't know that they have been hacked. It's clear that we're not going to be able to rely on the at traditional approaches and the traditional um, frameworks and that regulators are going to have to be open to alternative solutions outside the usual legal and regulatory framework. And I want to say one of the most important regulatory tools moving forward will not be the regulations we prescribe, is going to be digital um, literacy. But there, there are also other solutions that seem to be popping up, blockchain being one of them. The technology behind Bitcoin seems to be um, a good candidate, makes it possible for the individual to monetize personal data using smart contracts. But the, 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 the regulator will also have to consider industry and regulator, uh, Brian Ford's exhortation, which is that within blockchain, there are potential risks and protocol weaknesses that could be undermined, that could undermine the integrity of blockchain transactions. So that um, it seems to me where we have to look regulators and industry working together because I think it's going to be a period when we will have to have more um, cooperation. We have to focus on designing blockchains and any other similar um, uh, solution that would optimize the protection of privacy. My concluding remarks though is that this is not an area in which one can be um, pres prescriptive. I don't agree with some arguments I've heard that regulators must sit around and wait on the market to um, determine these issues and intervene, enter up on the reference when there's a problem. That to me is an outdated thinking. The exponential technologies are not just changing industry, they have to change also regulation and governance which have been built up over thousands of years and are themselves right. 
for um, disruption. But as a regulator, I conclude by saying my own thinking on how we should approach um, these matters are along the lines of a statement by Mr. Justice Fortas in a case fortnightly and united artists. The situation we are in calls not for the judgment of Solomon, but for the dexterity of Houdini. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cordell. That's a very uh, good setup for the rest of our conversation, but also a rather provocative start. Does anybody have any questions or comments that they want to make in particular about Cordell's presentation right now before we move on to the next speaker? Okay, mull it over. You'll have, you'll have plenty of chances uh, after this. So next we're going to hear from Christine Runiger, who is the Director for Security and Privacy Policy at the Internet Society, which is a nonprofit organization that I'm sure most of you are aware of. And Christine is going to talk to us about Internet trust and a whole lot of other issues, I think, following along the lines uh, of Cordell's presentation. Christine? Thank you, Anne, and thank you very much, Cordell, because you set that up very nicely. And I would like everyone to remember two things that Cordell said as I go forward. The first one is adequacy of law, and the second one, Cordell said, he and other regulators need to be open to alternative solutions and new tools. So keep that in mind. And while we're talking about privacy, I'm going to add another word. Let's stop talking only about privacy and talk about meaningful privacy because meaningful privacy is really vital for reinforcing trust in the internet and in society. And how do we get there, you ask? Well, currently we have an imbalance and generally what we see, as Cordell pointed out, that gen generally speaking, the data controllers are the ones who make the decision yet the data subjects are the ones that bear the privacy risk. It's not an easy problem to solve, but one way is through data ethics. What do we mean when I say data ethics? Well, the short version is do no harm. Just imagine how much better our world would be. When I talk about data ethics, I talk about ideas such as transparency, legitimacy, accountability, proportionality, and above all else, fairness, enabling individuals to exercise effective control and choice over their personal data. So that's one thing to think about. What other things could we do? I mean, these are all very obvious, you know, privacy in design, privacy in practice, strong internationally compatible legal frameworks and privacy norms. Notice I've used the word compatible, not harmonized. We'll probably get to that later in the discussion. Effective enforcement and, of course, to empower users. What we need to do is to think hard about what is data ethics, what that actually means in practice, and less about collecting and using <coughs> data because you can, but rather thinking about what's actually fair. For those of you who don't know about the internet technical community. Very quickly, I just want to say that the technical community, particularly the standards community, takes the issue of privacy very seriously. And you may not be aware that there is a lot of ongoing work to improve the privacy of internet protocols so that you don't just have privacy in business practices and tools, but you have privacy built in from the internet up. Anne came up with a whole series of questions that she was hoping that we would cover, and I, I would love to answer them all, and there may be time later, and I'm certainly hoping we get onto surveillance, but uh, I, I think perhaps to split the discussion a bit, I'll talk now about data portability. And uh, I don't have any slides, so you're gonna have to use your imagination. So I'm gonna suggest to you that we're currently in the second wave of data portability. So imagine a nice, beautiful wave and we go back to the first wave, and this was around the time, say, 2007 and 2008, when some of you may have been aware of the Data Portability Project. Um, and it was supported by major players, some of whom are here, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, which led to a model policy uh, in 2010. 
And in this first wave of data portability, uh, the kind of concept that, we, that was around at the time is that data portability is the ability for people to reuse their data across interoperable solutions. And so we ask ourselves, what problem was this first wave of data portability trying to solve? Well, it was trying to solve the, the problem of giving people the ability to switch services and to avoid vendor lock-in. And it was also there to encourage interoperability and open standards. And so arguably, the first wave of data portability was more grounded in consumer protection than privacy. There were some challenges. There were proprietary data formats. And of course, and this might be relevant to some of the other panelists, the network effect was also an, um, an important impediment to switching even when there was the availability of data portabil portability. So I said there were two waves. So you have a wave, and then you have the, the lull in between. So what did we see in the lull between the waves? Well, we started to see the emergence of data portability as part of the service that was offered to consumers. There were teething issues, as you would expect. Uh, what you would see between competitors, there would be limits and conditions, such as, OK, you can export, but only partially. You can't include your contacts, because that's important information. We want to keep it. Oh, OK, yes, you can take your data, but only to certain providers. Oh, OK, you can take your data, but only for our non-core services. And, oh yes, you can download it, but there's no automatic import via an API. So now we come to the second wave, and I say we're in the second wave right now, just as it starts to form as a wave. We see an emerging appetite for creating a legal entitlement or recognizing some sort of right to data portability. And one example is the Article 18 in the um, EU General Data Protection Regulation, which is not yet in force. There is another example that's currently in law but not in force, and that's in the Philippines. In this second wave, data portability has its origins in privacy and data protection doctrine, which actually influences its reach and application. And very quickly, let me just kick the tires a bit of this um, EU data protection regulation. It has some limitations, as they inevitably do. It's limited to personal data provided by an individual. So this might conceivably exclude personal data that hasn't been provided by the individual. For example, images uploaded by friends. And it might exclude anonymized data that an in individual may want to use with other services or technology, for example, sensor data. Most likely, it will include other people's data. But then we need to think about what might their attitude be if you want to take their data to another service. If we look at the definition too, it talks about in a structured and commonly used and machine readable format. Seems fairly standard, obvious text, right? But then if you unpack it a bit, okay, commonly used. Well, that doesn't necessarily imply interoperability. Um, it doesn't necessarily imply open standards. Is the format forward and backward co compatible? What counts as structured? And are there metadata requirements for meaningful conversion? There's no right to import. So there's no obligation on the receiving controller to accept the data. OK, maybe that's not so much of a problem, given, as Cordell said, the commercial value of personal data. It talks about receive the personal data concerning him or her, which implies the data is some sort of singular set. But what happens to the copy or copies that are held by the controller? And can an intermediary be used to pass the data? And then there are issues of bandwidth, if you want to export your data. And these are implications for emerging economies. <coughs> As I said when at the start, Anne gave us a really nice set of lovely questions. And I'd like to answer all of them. But it's time that I hand over to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Christine. And I mean, the data portability issue in, in, uh, in Europe is very hot right now because when this law comes into effect, this is not just about um, social media um, or other entities that you might have thought data portability would apply to. It applies to every data controller who provides, um, uh, who collects data, I should say, on the basis of contractor consent. So it's, um, it's going to be very wide reaching and uh, everybody's scratching their heads right now about how to 
how to implement this. So we thought it would be very important for people to start to understand that this is an important new right that will be coming into effect in Europe that many companies have absolutely no idea how they're going to implement as yet. So moving right along, um, unless there are any questions for Christine, please be aggressive and raise your hands if you would like to ask any clarification questions or make any comments at any point. Okay, uh, I'd like to turn over now to Monica Desai. Um, Monica is the Director of Global Public Policy at Facebook. Uh, she's had that role for now a long three months, uh, probably seems like three years. Um, but uh, before that, she has had many diff worn diff many different hats. She was my partner at Squire Patton Boggs prior to joining Facebook. But more importantly, uh, really for this discussion, prior to that, she was the chief of the um, Consumer Protection Bureau at the Federal Communications Commission in the US and also prior to that chief of the Media Bureau. So she has worn government hats, private uh, industry hats as, a, as a, an external lawyer and now with Facebook. Monica? Well, thank you for, uh, thank you Anne for inviting me here to participate and thank you to the IIC for hosting this conference. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity for Facebook to participate. Um, and, you know, I know from my FCC experience that there are many factors that policymakers have to take into consideration when evaluating whether to change rules or advance certain policies or whether to consider stepping back and letting the market develop. And, you know, those um, same evaluation factors are tough, whether we're talking about data protection or privacy or the range of other issues that we've been discussing over the course of the last few days. Um, you know, and, and from my perspective, an approach that will sustain and foster innovation and competition and consumer choice will always serve to, to help consumers and, and to help to benefit consumers. And it was interesting, in yesterday's very first session where regulators from across the globe um, discussed objectives and priorities in adapting to digital transformation. A lot of emphasis was, of course, placed on connectivity. And this emphasis aligns with Facebook's overall mission, which is to make the world more open and connected. Um, you know, as, as you all may be familiar, Facebook connects people through our social platforms and messaging applications. But you may be less familiar with um, the fact that we also support infrastructure projects in connection with this mission. Um, Facebook's Connectivity Labs um, is exploring a variety of technologies, including unmanned aerial vehicles, lasers, satellites, terrestrial wireless systems, and other ideas to, pro to provide connectivity for communities with different population densities. Um, we have an express Wi-Fi program to help address infrastructure barriers by empowering local entrepreneurs with the tools and technologies to sell Wi-Fi connectivity in an economically sustainable way. And, you know, as we've heard throughout the sessions and discussions yesterday and today, there's really no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, partnerships, cooperation, a range of different approaches will all help um, as we all wrestle with these issues. Um, and of particular relevance to this audience, uh, it'll require a regulatory framework that supports the fundamental objectives of reducing barriers to connectivity, supporting innovation, supporting the deployment of advanced network facilities, and of course promoting competition. And you know, consumers have been empowered in many ways by the services that are enabled through connectivity, um, not only access to greater information, to new forms of civic participation, but also the practical means to overcome many of the limitations imposed by distance or disability. And I know, I know that these are lofty ideas we all hear a lot of talk about. Um, I can give you some examples to make this more concrete, and examples that have been brought to consumers without specific regulatory mandates. Um, yesterday I heard um, two different regulators mention improving accessibility for people with disabilities um, as an area of focus. And you know, that was one of the areas of my focus when I was at the FCC, so I was personally very happy to hear regulators thinking about that. Um, at Facebook, this has been an area of focus. For example, earlier this year, we launched automatic captioning for photos, which uses advances in object recognition technology 
to provide uh, people using screen readers on mobile devices with an audio description of items a photo might contain as they swipe past photos, such as um, names of people tagged, their location, or just the basic contents of the pictures. Um, this product is now available to anyone using Facebook in English, and we're working to roll it out further. Um, we've also made it possible for people to add closed captions to the videos that they upload. Um, another important area of regulatory focus is public safety. When disasters happen, for example, people often turn to social media to check on their loved ones and to let their friends and family know if they're okay. To support um, the, the desire to use social media <coughs> services this way, we developed a safety check, which is a simple way to tell loved ones that, the, um, that they're safe during a crisis. So when an incident occurs, uh, people get a notification asking if they're safe. So Facebook can let friends know. Facebook activated safety check after disasters 20 times in 2016 alone, and over a billion people have been reached by safety check following a crisis. Um, and these are just a couple of examples of how the market is reacting to evolving priorities and evolving consumption patterns. And this, you know, this brings us back to a concept that's underlying the topic of this panel, is when does priority of users and the concept of choice, and what does that mean for policymakers and for regulators and for industry? Um, as these examples reflect, this means ensuring an environment that allows for experimentation and allows for investment. And it means taking a hard look at the policy objectives that are intended to be achieved and how regulation or deregulation or even attitudes toward those consumer um, function, um, patterns um, uh, just a, a fit within the policy objective. And it was interesting, a point that Cordell raised. I, um, he, uh, Cordell, you mentioned that you know, there are dangers or risks associated with profile-based advertising or profile-based business decisions. And I thought that was interesting because I just, a few days ago, I had a discussion with my husband about how he and I actually, too, enjoy getting advertisements that are relevant to me. I'm, I'm allergic to nuts, so I, I actually like getting advertisements about products you know, that I find out about that are nut-free because I get, you know, randomly, I guess, maybe not so randomly, you know, an advertisement that talks about such products. I, you know, it's helpful for me when I hear about a sale on items of clothing that my kids might enjoy having or, you know, a sports event that um, my husband might enjoy going to. And so I think, I think it's important not to make assumptions about, you know, what people want or don't want, but look closely at consumption patterns, look closely at consumer behavior, and then, you know, and ask about these issues as well, and then make decisions accordingly. Um, you know, as, uh, and it also means that, um, you know, when you take a hard look at these issues, it helps inform, it helps a lot in informing the decision-making process. For example, interoperability is an issue that is a topic of this, uh, of, of this panel. Um, because of the different nature and con uh, nature of digital services, existing regulations might be difficult to apply to an online service that merely uses telephone numbers as an identifier, but doesn't route those calls <coughs> over the public switch telephone network. It may also be that the concept of interoperability should be considered more broadly to include, for example, cross-platform interoperability, so not just interoperability over the public switched telephone network. For example, typically the use of online communication services is not limited to a single mobile handset or a single phone number at a particular location, but instead a consumer can access the, uh, a service cross-platform over a range of devices, such as PCs or tablets, laptops, or typically wherever Wi-Fi is avail available. So I think thinking about um, these concepts that we're regulating in a different age of technology, you know, is, um, it's important to think about how consumers can, can uh, take advantage of the changes in technology and, and use, um, use, their service, use these services 
before trying to think about what regulations or policies to impose. Um, anyway, I think my time is up, and so thank you for the opportunity to participate, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Monica. And I think, you know, it is, it is important that we keep a balanced approach and remember that there are positives uh, in the collection of, of data. I mean, as you mentioned, emergency services. In some cases, the telcos cannot locate the individual, but apps providers, certain apps providers, may have information that can be relevant to finding people. This is also in disaster recovery, disaster relief. Uh, you know, important issues need to be thought through around, you know, around these uses of data. Um, and if they're not collected in the first place, um, obviously, uh, or if they're restricted in their collection, this may not be possible. So thanks for sharing that. Um, next up is Donald Connor. We're going to have another view, but this side, this time from the telco side of the industry. Ah, we have a question. Before we move on to Donald, let's take that question. Have we got a mic? Just a sec. De México. De México. Uh, it's a question for Facebook. I heard that consumer and the user is, are very important for Facebook. You are implementing that law of application for the welfare of users. I, I want to know what is the position of Facebook in matter related to reputation of the users, something like the rights to be forgotten. As you know, it's a hot debate in USA and Europe, how to approach that. Uh, we have some example, for example, uh, in France, they are pushing very hard in order to implement the right to be forwarded. Uh, but uh, I would like to know what, what is the position, if there is a position of Facebook about that. You know, I honest, I literally have been with Facebook about 12 weeks, and I probably should know what the position is on the right to be forgotten, but I, I don't. And I don't know if we actually have a position on that topic, but if we don't, we probably should. Um, so I'm happy to find out what it is, and maybe you'll make us create one. So I'm, I'm glad, and I'll, maybe I'll get your information after the panel, and I'll let you know. Since it's an obligation under EU law, now you probably do. <laughs> I'm sure we have an, I, We absolutely have a position. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> but we're going to talk about that a little more on the panels, and then you know, um, I'm sure you'll get a, a several different perspectives on that. So moving right along to Donald Connor, who is Group Director, Regulatory Affairs for Vimplecom, uh, and I think you've had that role for a month now, Donald. Is that right? Forty-three days and counting. Oh well, you're it a veteran. Might, it then. might end very soon, though, depending on how this goes. But he's previously held a number of positions in uh, telcos around the world, including with Digicel, um, and um, has a, a lot of experience in that area. One of the things that we wanted to talk about was interoperability, as Monica mentioned, um, i.e., how, how in these different cultures of privacy do we arrange for the transfer of data from one country to another where there are very different regimes. So Donald's going to take that on, and we have your slides up. First, I want to say thank you for, to the IIC for having me here. Um, when I was looking at what panel to choose, I, this seemed to be the logical one because um, my first telecoms deal was with Anne LaFrance when she was general, when she was general counsel for MCI Worldcom and I was a junior paralegal working. Um, you're, you're really dating me, Donald. Thank I'm you. I'm dating myself <laughs> also. Um, and as we m moved from telecoms into the digital age. My last regulator before taking the job at Vimplecom in the digital world was Cordell, um, where we had a, a, uh, uh, a cable television service in Jamaica. I really wanted to um, just say a little bit about Vimplecom, since I know some of you know who Vimplecom is, some of you don't. Um, we have 2 million subscribers in 14 markets and about $9.6 billion. I'm sorry, 200 million subscribers, I should correct that immediately. 9.6 billion in revenue and operate in 14 markets from um, Europe and Italy um, to Algeria, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, and Moscow. So we have a wide range of regulatory bodies that we deal with at very different levels of sophistication development and uh, different points in their regulatory agenda. Yeah. 
In terms of cross-border data flows, what we've seen is a huge surge since 2005 and 2014 in, in cross-border um, data flows. We're looking at a 45% increase. In 2005, there was 4.7 terabits, and we're now in 2014 to 212 terabits. And I think that just shows you the importance of this cross-border um, data flow. What we do find, however, is the legal framework is lagging behind. Um, in, in terms of just raw numbers, there's um, 60 countries that have some form of data protection legislation around the world. Um, 108 have none, and 35 are in drafting phase. Um, what's clear to us as an operator is that a lot of the data protection is really outdated for the digital world. Um, or aren't compatible or missing. But having said that, we also recognize as an operator um, that insufficient protection can create negative market effects by reducing consumer confidence. And the corollary to that is perhaps that overlaying too stringent protection um, can, ad can adversely affect businesses and have economic consequences that are perhaps unintended as a result. <coughs> of the 161 WTO member states, um, 161 WTO member states um, have not agreed to any update of the existing rules to make them fit for the digital age. Um, there's great legal uncertainty because they press because the presently applicable distinctions between goods and services and between different sectors and subsectors do not fit with the digital reality. And I think that is the challenge that we all face in this room today, whether we're an operator or regulator or an OTT. What I think the lessons we have learned from the past in terms of cr cross-border data flow is isolationism and protection doesn't win. Um, in the long run, it only harms local business and investment um, because investment will go elsewhere. And it tends, you know, I think in one of the panels today, we discussed how piracy was affecting a, a particular industry and it, it does tend to favor, you know, the ones that ignore the rules and we have to avoid that. Do nothing however, is not the best strategies. Because I think controls are, as an industry, I think we believe that controls are necessary to mitigate the risk and protect consumers. And also to en enable and empower local firms to compete with the best, rather than shelter them with barriers. And I believe that is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Donald. Um, so now we will move to our last, but very not, not least um, of our speakers. Um, and I've been told that we can call you KS. Uh, KS is a professor at the Korea Law School and he's also director of the Open Internet um, for Korea. Um, and he's active on a whole range of issues in Korea. So I hope he'll tell us a little bit about that, but also wrap up on a number of these issues that we've already heard on and give a, the perspective of an academic uh, who is looking at these things from a legal perspective. KS? Yes. Uh, well, actually, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce you to uh, this uh, very carefully thought out uh, uh, questions that uh, our uh, renowned moderator, Anne, has uh, uh, proposed that we uh, answer. So. Uh, I'll go through the questions and I'll provide, I'll provide my uh, soundbite answer to those questions. Uh, that will, I think, kind of uh, cover any area that uh, other panelists uh, didn't cover yet. So, question one. Are consumer expectations changing when it comes to digital privacy and in which direction? Well, it is changing. I think a right to be forgotten um, decision or decisions uh, represent uh, such a change. Uh, if you look at right to be forgotten uh, decisions, 
they are not really uh, jurisprudentially um, you know, accumulated uh, decisions. Those are more aspirational. Uh, I feel the movement of consumer expectations in those uh, decisions. Um, and right to be forgotten uh, is being backed up uh, by uh, data protection laws that give data subjects ownership like control over data about themselves. I'm going to come back to this. Um, second question was, does this change in consumer expectations about privacy vary by country and region? My answer, yes. Uh, it is interesting that right to be forgotten jurisprudence is spreading uh, strong in Europe, but in the continents that were the former colonies of Europe, uh, there is a severe resistance uh, because there uh, have been uh, angers of the public against uh, impunity, uh, against the uh, uh, oppressions and exploitations that have not been remedied in those countries in Asia, uh, South America, and uh, Africa, uh, uh, resist blinding uh, themselves from the information that could help uh, obtain a redress to uh, the injustices in the past. So it varies by country and region. Um, yes, data protection, uh, yes, data protection laws are spreading in those other continents as well. But if you look at the decisions, uh, they come out in, uh, in a very uh, different manner uh, from how the European courts are handling it. Next question, how does the transactional context affect the assessment of uh, consumer expectations uh, about privacy. For instance, uh, uh, does the value of privacy vary uh, depending on whether uh, data is collected by business versus telcos versus online providers, governments? My answer is yes. Uh, I mean, the whole idea of data protection law is to protect powerless individuals entering into data transaction with a powerful, uh, agen uh, uh, powerful agencies and companies. Uh, so it, uh, it, it obviously, uh, I mean, the data protection law is actually uh, uh, equalizer. It's supposed to be an equalizer uh, for the uh, individuals who don't have the resources to uh, negotiate or uh, enforce upon the conditions of uh, disclosing their data in exchange for receiving the services from uh, governments and companies. Uh, so, uh, of course, the force of uh, data protection law uh, or the data protection norm uh, should vary depending on who is collecting. <coughs> Uh, the, the more relatively powerful the uh, data uh, collector is, uh, you know, in relative to the person giving the data, uh, it has to apply in a, a stronger manner. Uh, and in the end, uh, the consumer expectations are changing uh, overall. I mean, a couple of decades ago, people thanked online platforms like Yahoo for, uh, giving, uh, uh, for giving us uh, free email accounts or uh, you know, thanked other uh, online platforms for free blogging space uh, to be able to talk to the whole world. But now uh, people are saying the platforms should uh, pay, for the debt, uh, pay for the data uh, that uh, people are putting on their services. So uh, how shall we reflect this change in evolving uh, regulatory uh, paradigms around the world is 
and next question. My answer is this. Uh, I, I guess uh, ethics is an uh, uh, important, uh, important keyword here. For instance, Google, <coughs> Google monitors the contents of email, uh, not, not through you know, human uh, inspection, but Google uh, has the, its software scan the contents of email and attach uh, appropriate advertising to the email depending on uh, what's, in the, what's in the email. So if I say, if I write email to my friend, uh, do, do you want to go out for wine you know, uh, tomorrow, then in the email uh, shows up uh, advertisement for a wine shop. Now, in doing so, uh, Google made the effort to seek consent to that, consent to that, uh, that you know, profitable use of uh, uh, people's, uh, people's data. So Google's policy specifically said the contents of email will be scanned for advertising purposes, and it's still there. Uh, I know that these uh, uh, you know, terms and conditions uh, that are uh, really uh, parochial uh, are uh, cons considered uh, poisonous and are the evils in the digital society. But, I mean, we have, we've, we've had this problem for many years, not just for, uh, not just in data transactions, but in any type of consumer transaction. You know, look at insurance industry. Uh, you know, uh, esoteric terms and conditions are there to hurt uh, consumers. Uh, they have been there all the time. And the legal community uh, is not without a response. Uh, there are rules of, uh, you know, there are rules like uh, uh, contracts of adhesion. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, consumer protection laws that do respond to uh, esoteric uh, terms and conditions uh, that respond to uh, that respond to uh, unexpected uh, harms to the consumers. So uh, yes, nobody we nobody might have read that uh, nobody nobody might have read Google's term about scanning uh, email, but it's ethical that Google did that. Uh, there are other companies who will do that without even seeking, uh, you know, pretense of a, uh, seeking even a, a pretense of a consent uh, through a provision uh, through, the, through a provision in the terms and conditions. Next question was tension behind uh, well tension between privacy and freedom of expression, balancing. Uh, competing rights, uh, including the right to be forgotten. Well, uh, I said, you know, I'll come back to the, uh, uh, I, I'll come back to a data protection law. And data protection law, uh, the underlying, the overarching slogan of data protection, data protection law is that you own data about yourself. But if you think about it, I mean, how do you own data, right? Uh, data is a, a non-rivalous commodity. It's not something you can exercise exclusive dominion, and it's not something that originates, from, originates uniquely from you either. For instance, the fact that KS Park is a professor, do I own that data? Or does that data originate from me? Or does that data originate from my interaction with the society? If I give a lecture in an you know, empty room, that doesn't make me a professor. It's because there are students who come and listen to and learn from me that I am a professor. The fact that I'm a professor it's not something that I can own so that, you know, I'll require you to get my consent for telling other people that I'm a professor. 
Um, so what I'm trying to say is that data protection law uh, is not really uh, a mechanistic rule that can be applied in every situation. It is actually a metaphor. It is a metaphor that was created to protect individuals entering into data transactions with uh, governments and uh, agencies. Uh, and if you, uh, if you think about right to be forgotten uh, as conceptual, I mean, there was a classical right to be forgotten that's based on more classical conception of privacy. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. I'm talking about this new right to be forgotten jurisprudence coming out of a Google Spain decision. And there, um, you know, the court is uh, suppressing uh, publicly available information, which is a URL of, uh, you know, certain page containing uh, somebody's name or the uh, uh, data subject's name. But that is publicly available, uh, available information. And if we came up with uh, the concept of data ownership for the purpose of uh, equalizing the bargaining power of individuals in a, data, uh, in a data transaction, that metaphor does not apply to publicly available information. And uh, there is, uh, it, it will create more and more friction if you try to keep, if, if, you, if you continue to, if you, if you continue to try applying data protection law to publicly uh, available information. And I think that right to be forgotten has already shown uh, that friction uh, in uh, many